So our, the, the focus of our topic today, or our topic today, is personalizing instruction to address COVID-19 learning gaps. Um, last week, RHEL Central did a webinar on assessment to address those learning gaps. We all know that things are going to be a little bit different in the fall. And so we, we felt it was important to talk about, okay, we've assessed to figure out where kiddos are at. Now let's figure out what we're going to do to, a, to provide differentiated individualized instruction to students in the classroom. And in order to do that, um, I'll, before, before we do that, I should introduce RHEL Central a little bit. Um, RHEL Central is one of 10 regional education laboratories that is funded by the United States Department of Education, specifically the Institute for Education Sciences. Um, our job is to conduct applied research and provide technical assistance around the use of data and evidence to a seven state region um, that from Colorado, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming. Um, and we serve that region, and, but this webinar today is going out across the United States. And um, last week for our assessment webinar, we had representatives from 46 of the 50 states, including um, the District of Columbia. So we're really excited to, to share um, our work a little bit more broadly. So our presenters today, first of all, my name is David Dunosky. I'm a researcher um, at RHEL Central. Um, and then we have Jenny Gatta. Jenny is the Executive Director of Teaching and Learning at Westminster Public Schools here in Colorado. We have D Dylan Shalosky, who is an intermediate teacher at the Metropolitan Arts Academy at Westminster Public Schools, and Cody Kelly, an IB literacy teacher at Westminster High School. Um, just a little bit about Westminster Public Schools, and um, the three of you can uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Westminster is a um, a suburban school district um, to Denver on the northwest side of Denver, um, but it is a very unique school district in that it is a very, very, very diverse community, um, not only linguistically, but racially, um, and has a wide variety of, um, of SES <coughs> um, present in its community. So it's, it's a very, very diverse community in just about every way you can imagine. Um, one other critical thing to know about Westminster Public Schools is that they have implemented a competency-based system and have been doing so since approximately 2008. Somewhere back in there, they first started talking about it and working on it, and so have been working on improving and modifying their competency-based system throughout um, the, the remaining years, throughout the, the last 12 years, um, and are moving forward with it um, and are very proud of what they're doing. Um, this webinar today is not going to be about Westminster's competency-based system. Um, rather, we want to focus on what teachers are doing in the classroom. But because Westminster Public Schools really focuses on personal student needs and individual student needs, we felt that they would be ideal to, to speak about this. Right? So before I bring the three of them in, I just want to set the stage a little bit. What are we talking about here? Why are we having this conversation right now? Probably all of you by this point in time have seen these really rather scary numbers that are coming out from um, researchers across the country. These projected learning losses related to school closures, um, related to schools being essentially closed between March and, and May of this year. Um, there are projections that up to 63 to 68% of the normal gain that would have happened in those three months will be lost because of school closures in reading. And then 37 to 50 percent of normal of that normal gain in math. Um, these are really really scary numbers. But let's offer a little bit of uh, detail about how these numbers came about um, and and what they really truly mean. First of all, the the researchers that put this together um, made these projections based on the literature from chronic absenteeism and summer learning loss. And so these are simply projections about what they think could possibly happen, and most importantly, in the worst case scenario. Um, the, the, the authors of this particular report themselves do say that these should be considered the upper bounds of what could potentially could happen. And most importantly, these projections do not account for the fact that instruction has occurred during these school closure times. 
Um, teachers and school districts around the country have made this remarkable and heroic shift to providing instruction very quickly, making this a shift to providing instruction. So instruction has occurred, um, which is probably going to mitigate some of these losses as, as we move forward. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that the, the authors of this particular report do not believe that these losses are going to be universal. In fact, um, the top one third of students do have the potential to make gains in reading. Um, and this, there are going to be students that thrive um, in this online environment. The problem with this is that that is likely to exacerbate existing learning gaps. Those students who thrive in the online environment are likely those students who are already ex excelling and succeeding. And those students who were not in the regular classroom are likely to be those that are gonna fall, fall further and further behind. So although there is some good news here, that instruction that happened during this period of school closures um, will mitigate some of this learning loss and that some students will excel the chances are that learning gaps will widen um, is, is um, pretty significant. So given that, there will likely be the need when we start school up next year to address individual learning needs. Not every student is going to be at the same place as every other student. And in fact, it may be worse than it was before. And so that's why we're having this conversation today. So what is Personalized learning. Uh, personalized learning is a, is, is a really broad construct. There's a lot of different things that could be considered personalized learning. And there's a lot of different systems that have been put in place and ideas about what personalized learning is. Um, generally, personalized learning includes some sort of student ownership in their individual learning, the provision of sub individual supports to, to learners, um, trying to provide as varied experiences in the classroom as possible to meet individual student needs, providing student voice and flexibility and choice. Um, but these are all systemic level supports. We are going to focus today on what an individual teacher can do in their classroom to try to provide some personalization. We're not talking about systemic level changes here today. Rather, what an individual teacher in any school system could do to personalize instruction. There is a, um, a, a growing movement around personalized learning. Um, more and more school districts are experimenting with different forms of it throughout the country. Um, and in fact, the Department of Education and the Institute for Education Sciences has really put a lot of emphasis, a lot more emphasis on it. For example, in the Race to the Top District program, there were grants put in place and supports put in place to allow school systems to move beyond one size fits all models. And the Every Student Succeed Act um, specifically allowed the use of federal funds in order to try to implement these systems. So interest is growing in personalized learning. Um, with all that being said, the research base tends to be really rather thin at this point in time. And part of that is, is it's just a complicated, messy construct to try to measure. There are so many pieces and parts and, and variables to measure um, that it's very difficult for researchers to really get a true sense of whether or not personalized learning is working. Most of the research that's being done so far um, has been descriptive. Uh, what are school districts doing um, in describing the practices that they're putting in place? There have been some attempts to try to measure impact. Um, there have been several studies in which researchers have compared um, students from one school that have implemented um, personalized learning to another school with very similar, de uh, very similar demographic pro um, profile and looked at their different, um, the difference between their performance. And there is some promising evidence that personalized approaches do have promise. At this point, though, the research doesn't necessarily say that it will make a difference. But logically, if we address individual student needs, it makes sense that students should perform better. It's just that the research hasn't been able to demonstrate that at this point in time. There are a bunch of references. There's a, um, those, those studies that I've talked about are referenced here. The handout 
um, which the link should be available in your chat box now, um, does have um, many of these resources and references so you can take a look at it on, at your leisure. Um, look to see what some of the research is saying so far and what some of those descriptive studies about different systems are doing, have done. But we're going to focus again, we're going to focus our conversation on what an individual classroom teacher can do, can do. Not necessarily the large scale, um, big picture systemic change, but rather individual classroom teachers. And so at this point, I want to bring in Dylan and Cody and Jenny and ask my first question. So if you were to meet this random person on the street and you and for some reason conversation turned into personalized instruction, how would you define personalized instruction in, in three sentences or less? Let's start with Cody. Uh, for me, <clears throat> it's really about meeting kids where they're at and then creating experiences and opportunities that will excite and uh, inspire their own curiosity. All right. All right, how about you, Dylan? Um, I'm gonna use a bit of a metaphor. Um, since we're in Colorado, I'll go, imagine you're going on a hike with your students. Um, in a traditional classroom, the teacher would be leading the hike um, and moving you know, as many rocks and, and things that are getting in the way with the hope that as many kids as possible will get to the top. But with personalized learning, um, teachers are hiking alongside their students. And but like Cody said, meeting them where they're at and making discoveries with them um, and, and being okay that there might be some unknown, but getting messy with your kids. All right, right, messy with your kids. That sounds dangerous. All right. How about you, Jenny? Uh, so for me, it's just a, a model where students are active and empowered um, to advance upon mastery based on a clearly defined set of competencies. All right, okay. So let's take a look at uh, more specifically about what, what this looks like, what this can look like in the classroom. And um, Dylan and Cody, um, I wanna start with, with this idea of using data. I mean, in order to personalize instruction, we probably need to have a pretty good sense of where kiddos are at, right? Mm -hmm. So um, how do you use data to identify students' needs? Go for it, Dylan. Okay, um, so you need to constantly be taking a temperature gauge of your student's understanding. So, um, you know, you are always using formative assessment and it could be something as traditional as an exit ticket or um, beyond that, there's so many other means for your students to um, reflect and, and, and show. And then you have to also kind of um, create this culture of, revising goals and um, you know it goes from students looking at their own data and tracking it um, and, and, and showing ownership over that and it, it then extends to teachers and to the school and the district as a whole. When, when we think of data um, I think it, there's a tendency to think of data as coming from assessments, traditional assessments, quizzes, <laughs> things like that. Um, is that the type of data we're talking about or, or is the idea of data expanded for you? Oh, I totally 100% think it's expanded. I think your traditional assessment is obviously one piece of it, but um, you know, we even as, a, as adults show our understanding of the world in so many different ways and we have to offer that to our students too and not expect them to all conform to to one test or to one project and, and really cultivate that choice and agency. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Cody, how do you um, use data? I think what's important, you know, in our school district, we are comp city based. So all of our students know that within a given assignment, there is a specific skill they're working on <laughs> and you don't overwhelm them with too much. So I think sometimes in the traditional system, students you know, complete an activity or a test and then they end up with a percentage and then thus that, you know, corresponds to a grade. And so they say, well, how do I get better? I have a 67. And the 67 isn't really, um, isn't a good definition of, of where they need to go or where they're at. So instead, if the, if the assessment and the data is very skill-based, then no matter how that data comes in, whether it be multiple choice or essay or discussion or just even a conversation with the teacher during a one-on-one, -on -one, um, can provide evidence for a specific skill. 
Um, so with that combined with PLCs, we use a lot of personal or professional learning communities in our, in our schools. Every week we sit down with our team department, all the teachers who teach that, that class and that level. And we take a look at, you know, we were working on this skill last week, this one specific skill. How did the kids do? Let's look at some samples. Let's look at a high, medium, and low of each. Let's, let's compare and contrast. Let's do some even collaborating of our scoring and then talk about, you know, where is the kid missing this one little thing, right? So if it's an essay, there's a lot of components that make up an essay. So to, to, to focus on all of it at once is not only cumbersome, but overwhelming for the brain, for both the teacher and the student. So instead, this first essay is focused on your ideas and themes. That's it try to do the best you can for the other stuff, but what I'm really assessing and teaching and looking for you to grow here is that particular skill. And then everything is narrowed down for the kids. Then you can really kind of see what about the idea are they missing? What about this particular task are they, they just need to get by adding a certain step or adding a certain perspective? So, so Dylan, you mentioned um, students tracking their own data and and, and Cody, you're talking about this idea of, of, of having to really, um, you know, hone in on particular skills. How do you know what a student is supposed to know? So um, our district, we use proficiency scales, which is, um, which is kind of, is, is our curriculum. And so um, that is, and it's, and we as teachers worked alongside Jenny and, um, and other administrators to write the proficiency scales and using the Colorado um, academic standards. But that is the core of what we do. And so I think being aware of what your students are expected to know is foundational. Yeah, and once you set that parameter from there, you could have you know, a vertical alignment between various grade mm -hmm. levels and within the year itself. So ideally within you know, the Englang one team, uh, we would want each teacher to be progressing through those scales and those targets in um, the same order and the same timeline so that when we do sit down for data digs or PLCs, we're all generally sort of working on the same skill with our kids at the same time. And in that way, we can collaborate and share data and connect ideas um, and build a, a more supportive instructional team um, rather than just feeling like you're a teacher in a silo on an island by yourself. So, you know, a, a, as a former teacher, this idea of, of constantly bringing in data and using it scares me a little bit, I'll be honest with you, because, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, I'm sitting in front of a class of 30 kiddos. On a regular, ongoing basis, how do you collect this data? How do you know where a kiddo is at at any given point in time? Um, I mean, at the elementary level, we start at pre-K and kindergarten. Um, where kids are are already demonstrating the ownership over their learning. So they're telling their teachers in, in the systems that the teachers have set up, like, I'm ready to show you that I can do this. And they're, they're moving on to the next step, um, you know. And then we, we jump right into data notebooks, where students are logging into our learning management system called Empower um, and tracking what they know and what they need to know next. And it's it's this constant um, state of revision. You're never stagnant. You're never saying like, I'm done. There's always something, something to do afterwards. Right, I agree. And I think our online management system is a big key piece of that because they're the students, the teacher, the parents, whoever might care about their success can see exactly the progression they've made on any given standard or target. Um, and what scores they're getting on those things. So kids can get on and say, oh, for ideas and themes, out of the six assignments Ms. Kelly has worked on with me, I've only scored proficient on two of them. Um, and so then they can determine, hey, what did I do on those two assignments that didn't quite hit the mark on these ones? I could use that time to sit down with the kid and show them, say, hey, look at this one. You killed it on this one. And, and on this one, you just should have maybe added in this piece like you did here with this assignment. And then they can see how their own work um, can be leveled up or compared to other kids. Um, so they really can monitor their own progress. It doesn't just fall on the teacher for us to keep track of all these numbers and all this data. It's all in that management system. Um, and students can work 
independently through that system. Let's say a kid is ahead in class and feels maybe a little bored and wants a challenge and says, hey, miss, I really want to move on to the next target. I can get them going on a playlist in our system and they can start completing some of that that work and that practice independently. Um, so I think it does help if you have some sort of a, a place where this data goes, whether that just be a data notebook within the classroom mm -hmm. um, or a chart that shows the kids, this is what we're gonna do throughout the year on this timeline. And if you're caught up, you are right here. And if you're not, that's okay. You just have to start back here and then keep moving, right? So they see it as like a progression of things to learn as opposed to a list of things they can't do. Yes, 100%. And I, I'd like to add on too, I think it's really important we're teaching kids at a super young age how to have professional discourse and talk about um, their own learning. And you know, we as adults have PLCs and we set that up for our kids too. So they're having conversations with one another about where they're at and what they want to do to continue learning and it's transparent but it creates a culture of trust and ownership um, so so one more question and then and then we're going to move on and see if there's any audience questions um, to to address here if you were um, uh, try to imagine you're working in a normal uh, school system that doesn't have some of the supports in place like the LMS and and proficiency scales and those things um, if where would you suggest a teacher start to try to collect and manage a, more data about what their students know and are able to do? Um, on your first day of school, start by creating a shared vision with your kids and ask them, and, and I think it's more important now than ever after COVID and then being outside the building, why is your education important? Um, and, and that gives you a grounding to then, you know, start collecting the data and start something small. If you're a third grade teacher and your math standard is, is those multiplication facts, start by tracking their knowledge of the facts. Um, start with something that, that's not overwhelming and then see if you can put that into the student's hands. Yeah, and I think that, that element of um, ensuring that when you're starting to work with the kids in this way, that you really have to build trust. They need to understand that you're there to support them and guide them through the process, not to judge them and evaluate them. Because I think that's the big difference is that when you feel evaluated, you're less likely to you know, open yourself up, be vulnerable, make mistakes. Um, and failure and mistakes is, uh, is like the whole process. <laughs> that's what it's all about. And so you really have to try to turn that off for kids. And once you can kind of set that stage, like Dylan suggested, then when you're collecting data, it's not like this overwhelming burden of, oh, look at all of my ugly data. This is what mm -hmm. I am. Instead, it's, oh, this is where I'm at. And this is what I need to jump here. And then when they get more data, they see they make those jumps. And then it becomes yeah. almost like a game, right? They want, they want to level up and move on to the next thing and they get they get a bit of a, a, a joy around that. So I, I think Dylan's pretty good at doing those data notebooks and data charts in her classroom. Um, and I've seen them work really well. So if you don't have a learning management system or a bigger um, you know, program to use, you could easily just start with like diagramming out the things, the most important essential skills you want your kids to know and understand that year. And keep mm -hmm. it low. Like if you look at the Colorado Academic Standards, there's a multitude of things, but that's where you could pull your skills from. Like go check that out and pull the most essential 10 skills of the year. What should a ninth grader be able to do in this class by the end of the year? Lay those out. What should be top first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and show them this is what we're going to walk through together. Mm -hmm. And then as you move through those targets, I think it's really important to give them the opportunity to show you what they already know. So like Dylan said, the, the data pulling can be really small and, and non-threatening. It could be something that they already know and they're giving that to you. And then from there you're assessing, oh, they know this, they don't know this piece. So now we can add this in. Um, and that'll, that's what allows for the personalization and kids to not feel either dumbed down or um, overwhelmed by content they don't understand. Okay. Great. So I want to throw it out there. Uh, Matt, do we have any questions? for our presenters so far. Yeah, so Cody and Dylan, thank you very much for those specific examples about how students uh, monitor their learning um, and sort of own the data. 
we have a request from some of the participants for a couple of specific examples of what that looks like in your classrooms. Sure. Um, so every day our students are working within those data notebooks. Um, and it's everything from tracking their dibbles, fluency and accuracy to um, self-reflecting on their writing and using student facing rubrics to um, you know, check their understanding. Um, and, and it's just built into to what we do every single day. It's using a lot of small group ins instruction to target um, you know, skills that you've identified that one or two students might need and, and being okay that it's not going to be the traditional teacher in front of the classroom. You have to be okay. There might be some controlled chaos but that means that every single kid in your class is actively learning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think within the classroom, it looks like a lot of things. There's still some direct instruction, of course, like that has to, that has to happen, but a lot of cooperative learning and students engaging with each other, um, students doing some awareness and thoughtful reflection on their own work and their own performance. Um, you know, constantly checking in. So every day we don't just come in, I'm like, okay, let's get started, he, open your books. Um, you know, we start by identifying what is our objective today? What are you supposed to be able to do when this 45, 55, whatever minutes are up? Um, and that kind of sets that stage that so they're focused on that target. So whenever they're mm -hmm. lost in class or whenever they feel like they can level up, then they know that's the thing they're trying to do. Um, and then within class, depending on what it is, if it's the beginning of something, I'm probably just building background information, I'm giving them some initial stuff. But once we really get into the thick of the work, it looks like, um, you know, having students determine, you know, what group they might need to go to for assistance today. And then I can pull groups with kids and we can sit there and work on a specific aspect of the target that they're confused by. But they get to decide that, right? They get to say, this part is what I don't get. Can you help me with this? And then there's you know, a, a, an assignment or really rather an experience like, you know, stations or some sort of um, multiple group uh, system running in the class so that kids can do different things at different times um, and still get that individualized time. So for me, it takes a lot of structure and planning and you mm -hmm. have to, and once you have the plan and once you've taught the kids how to do it, they can do it just fine. But the beginning of the year requires a good month of just like, how do you log into the learning management system? How do you read the data and place it in your notebook? What are you looking for when you do that? How does it make you feel? What does it make you want to immediately do? Give up, go forward. How can you combat those feelings? So there's a lot of handholding in the beginning, for sure. And then once that sort of settles in, the kids start just functioning on their own and they start flying faster and higher than even they think they can. And celebrate success celebrate their growth, celebrate when they've, they've leveled up um, and work that into your everyday, your, your everyday experience in your classroom. Yeah. And I think also this might sound <laughs> weird at first, but hang with me, celebrate failure. Mm -hmm. It is a natural part of everything. And I think that the more comfortable kids are with failure, the more comfortable they are at taking risks. So in my classroom, I am openly honest about my failures. I'll be like, me guys, too. I didn't do this thing and I'm feeling really bad about it. And maybe you feel that way too sometimes and I'll try to give them something or I love when kids correct me in class. It's like my favorite moment. And when they're right and I'm wrong, it's my favorite moment because it's an opportunity for me to be like, see, <laughs> we're not perfect and we're not right all the time. And that's good. That's, that's, that's the good stuff. Um, so I think creating that community and culture within the walls of your room is probably the most important thing to do before you even consider anything else. Because if they don't trust being there, they won't trust themselves to push. And it can start in kindergarten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think we've already started to stray into this idea of addressing needs. And I have about three or four minutes only to, to, to get to this. So can you describe what this instruction looks like in your classroom? I mean, is this a case where every kid is on a computer and, and you don't get to do anything with them or, you know? Not, no. And especially not every day, you know, every day is a bit different. Um, my, my class is pretty structured in that the first five to 10 minutes is what I call mindful minutes. We spend that time to check in on life, self, health, to-do lists, uh, breathing, um, being grateful, 
considering which teacher you might talk to that week to get some help, um, meeting your neighbor, getting to know the names of the people in the room. Like these are all little mindful awareness things. And then we move into some sort of mini instruction. So I don't speak for more than 20 minutes at any given day. Um, and that instruction might be whole class, especially if we're early on in a unit and it's the beginning foundation, um, or that might look like groups of instruction. So in a high school IB class, I get a, a little bit of more leeway in that I can send my IB kids over to the quarter and they can work on something pretty solidly while I work with other kids. But even young kids do this. Like if they know the expectation and they get positive reinforcement for doing it, they will. And so then after they've had a little bit of instructional time, then either before or after that, I always incorporate um, cooperative learning. So this is where the students actually engage with each other about the content so that they can build ideas off of each other and not just think that I'm the only expert in the room because I'm not. Um, so that's, you know, turn and talks or, you know, round robin shares within a table. Sometimes it's a more active up and moving activity. And then by the end of the hour, they produce some sort of you know, demonstration of knowledge. And that looks a lot of different ways. Maybe it's on a computer, maybe it's on a slip, maybe it's just a raise of hands and a move into certain corners of the room to show me where mm -hmm. you're at with something. So depending on where you're at in the content, that looks different, but it's not just a bunch of kids on a computer all the time. And if that's the way you're doing it, you're not doing personalized learning. You have to be engaging with the kids and they need to be engaging with each other. Yeah, in, in my classroom, we are project-based and, and we use the workshop model often. Our, our computers are a tool, more or less, for researching and, and for extending learning. Um, but like Cody said, if, if that is all you are doing, then that is not being responsive to our kids. Okay. So. Well, great. Um, so yeah. Matt, any questions for our presenters? Yeah, how do you use a personalized approach to address the needs of English learners and students accessing special education services? Go ahead, Dylan. Okay, um, so our district is, is pretty wonderful about this where our CLD um, and special ed interventionists are really worked into our system. Um, and, and I think personalized learning actually lends itself to helping those students even more um, than a traditional setting. Um, because, you know, in our classrooms, every single kid is getting what they need individually. And so it lends it to offer the scaffolding and supports necessary for, um, you know, English language learners and special ed students to also grow and also learn. Um, it, it is built for that. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, I think traditional scaffolding and differentiation um, techniques are really helpful in this system. You know, if, 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 if I'm meeting a kid where they're at and they're at a certain level in their English proficiency, then it might behoove the student, me to give the student, you know, sentence stems mm -hmm. to give them the start of the paragraph and then they finish it or they fill in the blanks. You know, there's lots of things you can do to still obtain the knowledge um, and still allow them to practice their English. Um, I know in the beginning of the year, I tend to do a lot of sort of translating at first just to make them feel comfortable, like they don't have to perform right away, but eventually, you know, they need to be practicing English within the English class. And so that, that can be tough, but um, I think a lot of one-on-ones and working with them individually, noticing which words they can say. So we use the WIDA descriptors quite a bit. Um, and that's where, you know, at the beginning, I said it's important to identify what can the student do, not what they can't do, because that's massive. Any adult knows that I don't know anything <laughs> like I thought I did when I was a kid, right? And so it's not about what you can't do, but rather what you can. And so if you're actually intervening with kiddos and you're having one-on-one -on -one conversations with them, then you know what the, the kid can do. And they can show that to you in a multitude of ways. It doesn't have to be verbal. It could be written. It could be a diagram. It could be, you know, in a photo story. There's lots of ways that kids could um, demonstrate their knowledge. So it's about being flexible for those adaptations of demonstration. Um, but also making sure you have that one-on-one -on -one understanding of where do they fall in this I can list. I can say complete sentences. Okay, great. So I know on my next assignment with that kiddo, rather than writing a five paragraph essay, their goal is just to write complete sentences about this idea. 
right? And then I'm still getting that same standard and skill looked at, but doing it in a more approachable way for those folks. Okay. Well, Dylan and Cody, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and, um, and, and your knowledge and expertise. Um, and thank you for being teachers. I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny now, and we're gonna talk very briefly about systemic supports. Jenny, I have about two minutes here, so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Tell your thunder, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You're the you're the expert. <laughs> to allow this to happen. So I, I think the ladies have talked about a lot of this. So we started with that clearly defined set of competencies that I think is essential, and it's what allowed us to make this just immediate pivot to the remote learning model um, due to COVID. And um, Dylan was a little generous in saying she worked with me where. I, I brought together a group of teachers that created these competencies and I see some questions about um, how do you do this in small groups and I would say really we just had three to five teachers which you could do even in a building across a grade span PK two three five so I think even in an individual school it is possible because that's the key is to start these students up in their data notebooks you need clearly defined expectations and then our teachers just laid them out on the ground and said, and here's the order we would teach them. And to get to Cody's point around, what's the order we would recommend knowing that kids are gonna pace differently through that. So it seems daunting, but even in small PLCs within an individual building, I believe you can do it, but you have to be explicit with kids on the front end for them to be able to personalize and know how I progress through the expectations. So that I think is key. Um, we've been able to do it at a district level, but I think it's it's possible and there's there's tons of resources out there to be able to do it. Um, that also allows us to monitor progress and a lot of questions. The ladies have talked a lot about our, our learning management system, but we still um, in our early years that wasn't, you know, clearly built out. So we had sheets of paper that had the instructional progression and we still use them today because mm -hmm. kids need both modalities. Some kids love that computer and some kids it's the tactile of crossing off a box. So we created an eight by 10 sheet of paper that has a box for each one of the competencies or proficiency scales, whatever you're gonna call them. And then kids can, in their data notebook, say, all right, I've completed that one. This is my next one. And that can be all done paper and pencil without a fancy system to back it up. Mm -hmm. um, we use that system so that, um, especially in this COVID era, my kiddo, I believe strongly enough in the system, I bring him to the district and he had, he ended the year with two proficiency scales left in his first grade progression. And rather than him just missing those forever and we socially promote him next year, our systems monitors that so that when he starts next year, he'll finish those two and then he will progress to the next level. And that way we don't create gaps in his learning forever that we miss generating narratives, which is a really tough thing to teach in an online environment and our teachers weren't trained to do that. So that's one that just, you know, was left open and, and the teacher just didn't feel like I had enough evidence. And so he'll finish that one up and this having clearly defined expectations, now he can move to the next teacher. Even if he switched to a different school, we've defined those and he can finish those up and then progress at any time and celebrate them as the ladies talked about. Um, and I would say, you know, some, some silver linings as, as Cody talked about the playlist, some other big things as I think our kids taught us, even though we talk a lot, a lot about student agency, um, they demonstrated even down to our kindergarten students that, you know what, when we created these playlists, um, a lot of our teachers felt like they couldn't do this on their own and they showed us pretty quickly that they can and our teachers, our primary teacher said, I will never let go of these things now. So they're building playlists and thinking about now station rotations and centers in my classroom, I am multiplied across that classroom. And so now I think we've, we've talked about these things a lot and, and that's one of the silver linings out of this, that, that those things will make us stronger when we go back to face-to-face -to -face and when there's a good chance we have to go back out that these learnings, and because we have the competencies, then we can also share those things across the system. Okay. Well, I hate to cut everybody off. I think this is something that we could continue to talk about forever, but we're rapidly running out of time. So thank you all very much for your time, your expertise, um, and being willing to share that. There's a couple things that I need to go over very quickly. So first of all, I wanna share the poll results. I never get, did get a chance to get back to that, just so we could see where everybody is at. Um, so if we could just go ahead and share those results.
So it looks like, you know, hybrid is going to be pretty important going back in the fall. And we're going to have to really think about how we can deliver some of these personalized strategies, um, not only in person, but, but to do them online. So um, it's going to be a very interesting fall for everybody as we move forward. All right, um, a couple last things, then we're going to wrap this up. So just for everyone to know, there is um, the RHEL program has put together a, a variety of different resources available. Um, and this, um, this uh, link is actually available in the handout. So if you want to download that handout, you can look at that link. Um, but there, in a variety of different, there's, there's handouts, there's what we call FAQs or frequently asked question sheets. There's um, a number of different videos. Uh, with different aspects of dealing with this, the, the COVID-19 closures. And so there's a lot of different great resources there, all research-based, um, put together by the RHEL programs across the country. So please check that out. Again, thank you to our presenters. Thank, thank you, you for joining us today. Um, and I hope everyone has a great summer and um, recharges and is ready to, to run full into next year because it's going to be a challenging one. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.